Welcome to Counter Apologetics. Welcome to Counter Apologetics. I'm your host, Emerson Green, and today we'll be discussing evolution. While atheism and Darwinism are not the same thing, as an atheist, I often find myself explaining evolution in debate and conversation. Atheism and evolution are often treated as if they're intertwined or even interchangeable by some people. Personally, I became an atheist long before I understood a single thing about evolution or even cared about biology, and that's because you don't need evolution to be an atheist. Some people were atheists long before Darwin was even born, and opinions vary on this subject, on the relationship between evolution and religion, but this episode isn't so much about the Francis Collins of the world who believe that evolution and Christianity are not only compatible but complementary. This is instead about the view shared by Richard Dawkins, Ken Ham, 40% of Americans and most of my family, namely that there is something deeply incompatible between Christianity and evolution. Answers in Genesis, Ken Ham's creationist propaganda organization, sums up nicely the reason for their hostility towards evolution. Quote, God's people need to stand on the truth of God's word beginning in Genesis 1-1 and not compromise with the secular religion of the day, evolution and millions of years. The more this compromise runs rampant in the church, the more we will see people doubt God's word in Genesis and be put on a slippery slope to unbelief, end quote. Or in other words, if you're saying this part over here, it says God made land animals and man on the same day is not true, then ultimately, why should I believe this bit over here? The bottom line is that evolution threatens biblical literalism, which eventually leads to atheism. And why would God be so misleading? What's the point of giving an account of creation that is totally at odds with all the evidence that would ever be collected on the age of the earth, the relatedness of life on earth, and the origins of humans? This is one area where I agree with creationists. There is no reason God wouldn't simply give the actual account of our origins, or at least be clear if he wasn't doing that. And was there a particular point that, or something that you read or an experience you had that sort of said, yeah, this is it, God doesn't exist? Oh, well, by far the most important, I suppose, was understanding evolution. Um, I think the evangelical Christians have really sort of got it right in a way in seeing uh, evolution as the enemy, Um, whereas the more, what should we say, sophisticated theologians who are quite happy to live with evolution I think they're deluded, and I think the, I think the evangelicals have got it right uh, in that there really is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity, and I think I realized that at the age of about 16. The Bible clearly did not anticipate evolution or the relatedness of life on earth or the place of humans in nature. The Bible depicts humans as separate from nature, not a part of it. The Bible sees humans as the point. Evolution gives us a much more humble place in the history of life on Earth. The Bible in no way indicates that we should expect there to be other kinds of humans, and yet we are not the only humans that have ever existed. We're only one species of human of six in the genus Homo. We're going to debunk the most common objections to evolution from creationists. There will be multiple episodes on the topic of defending evolution, though not in a row. I'm not sure when the next one will be, but it'll probably be about intelligent design or theistic evolution. This episode is going to be more about young earth creationists. I can see how one might say that I'm going after low-hanging fruit and easy targets, but according to data from this year, biblical creationists make up approximately 40% of the United States, which is around 130 million people, so I'm pretty sure everyone listening has had some experience with them. So we're going to briefly address 20 common objections to evolution from creationists. Number one, evolution is just a theory. So a scientific law is not better than a scientific theory. However these words are used in other professions within science, a law explains what will happen under certain circumstances, while a theory explains how it happens. Newton's laws of motion and the germ theory of disease are two good examples. 
heliocentric theory will never be called the law of heliocentrism, no matter how sure we are the Earth goes around the sun and not the other way around. Same with the theory of relativity or atomic theory. A theory never graduates to a law, no matter how sure we are that it's correct. A theory incorporates laws and facts to try to explain some part of nature. Number two, why are there still chimpanzees? Other primates are our cousins. We didn't come from monkeys. We and monkeys share a common ancestor, just like you and your cousin didn't come from each other, but share a common ancestor. The only difference is that our common ancestor shared with chimpanzees or bonobos goes back millions of years further. People often ask me, if we're descended from chimpanzees, how come there are still chimpanzees? Well, we're not descended from chimpanzees. We're both descended from a common ancestor who lived there about six million years ago. That common ancestor then produced two branches, one of which went to us humans, and one of which went to chimpanzees, branching further to produce bonobos and common chimpanzees. We are all cousins. We are not descended from chimpanzees. Number three, I'll believe in evolution when a chimpanzee gives birth to a human. So that would upend our entire understanding of genetics and disprove evolution for a couple reasons. For one, we don't think humans came from chimpanzees. We think that humans and chimpanzees are cousins. So if a bonobo gave birth to a human, that would mean we were really wrong. This kind of radical change in phenotype, from cognitive ability to physical appearance, is not at all what evolution predicts, especially not in one generation. We absolutely would not expect to see those kinds of changes in one single generation. We would expect a smooth gradient of change in the gene pool over successive generations. And we certainly wouldn't expect one species to give birth to a separate species. Number four, no one was present when life appeared on Earth and witnessed it evolve. Or paraphrased, you weren't there, how do you know? This doesn't bear decisively upon whether evolution should be considered a fact. Richard Dawkins answers this objection in his book Science in the Soul. He writes, quote, Nobody has lived long enough to see the continents move, but the theory of plate tectonics is overwhelmingly established, supported by a mass of evidence so large as to be beyond even unreasonable doubt. On the other hand, hundreds of eyewitnesses claim to have observed the sun miraculously changing direction at Fatima at the behest of the Virgin Mary. Such eyewitness evidence cannot demonstrate that the sun really reversed itself, if only because the sun can be seen from much of the world at any one time, and no eyewitness outside of Fatima reported the event. If the sun had behaved in the way described, our planet, if not the entire solar system, would have been destroyed. Eyewitness testimony is not all it's cracked up to be. End quote. The fact is that all sciences rely on indirect evidence. Physicists can't see subatomic particles directly, but the theories that incorporate the existence of subatomic particles are successful. Direct observation is not the only way to get reliable information. This can also present itself as the question, has evolution ever been observed? And the answer is yes, from bacteria which develop antibiotic resistance, to plants and foxes and humans, it has been observed. One long-term experiment by Richard Lenski and his colleagues at Michigan State University involving 45,000 generations of E. coli bacteria have been especially vindicating. This usually leads straight into, no, no, that's microevolution you're talking about. I meant macroevolution. Number five, microevolution has occurred, but not macroevolution. So macroevolution is just microevolution with more time. Evolution is a cumulative process, and giving enough time and geographic separation, what creationists call macroevolution, is inevitable. It would be like saying that dropping your phone is just an example of microgravity, but the sun exerting influence on the planets is macrogravity. They're both the result of the same theory, and it's a nonsensical distinction. And I'm not throwing out the micro and macro distinction as always unhelpful, I'm only saying that it's illogical to accept the one, but not the other. Number six, evolution has never been observed. So evolution has been observed with serious practical consequences, like with the example I used of bacteria gaining antibiotic resistance. Of course, all the examples would be labeled microevolution by creationists as if that invalidated the observation. But macroevolution has been observed too, but only indirectly, which should go without saying. Inferences from fossils and DNA that wouldn't make sense under creationism fit neatly into evolutionary models. A murder may be unwitnessed, but inferences based on evidence like fingerprints, DNA, and footprints can settle the matter beyond a reasonable doubt. 
We have facts like those, and we create a theory that explains those facts. Number seven, evolution is unfalsifiable. When J.B.S. Haldane was asked what would prove evolution wrong, he said rabbits in the Precambrian. If any fossil were found out of order in an earlier strata than it should have been, that would falsify evolution. Not only rabbits, but bones from humans or bones from anything else in the Precambrian. John René, writing for Scientific American, says, quote, Hypotheses can be tested by checking whether they accord with physical evidence and whether they lead to verifiable predictions about future discoveries. One should not and does not find modern human fossils embedded in strata from the Jurassic period, 65 million years ago. Evolutionary biology routinely makes predictions far more refined and precise than this, and researchers test them constantly, end quote. Some creationists have tried to answer why there are no bones in the Precambrian by invoking Noah's worldwide flood. They say all the animals would have run for the high ground as the waters rose, and this is why there are no rabbits in the Precambrian. One reason among many why this isn't a good answer is that we would still expect to see bones in the Precambrian from animals who were trampled in the stampede or who were already dead. Number eight, modern genetics has disproved evolution. So this is straightforwardly false. Genetics has shown the relatedness of all life on Earth, and the predictions one would make based on the evolutionary branches of the tree of life, or the bush of life, or whatever metaphor suits you, is exactly what we've found studying genetics. All cells on Earth are capable of reading any piece of DNA from any life form on Earth. The universality of the genetic code is very strong evidence for a common ancestor from which all life descended. I mean, the evidence is actually rather substantial. It's, it's not just fossils, you know, I mean, it's DNA. Presumably you, you're not concerned about DNA. You accept the existence of DNA, do you? I think DNA helps to prove that each person is an individual created yes. uh, and uh, as distinct from one another. If you look at the DNA of all animals and all plants, what you find is a beautifully arranged hierarchy. You find that our DNA is close to chimpanzees, slightly more distant from monkeys, slightly more distant still from rats, slightly more distant still from lizards. The whole thing falls into a beautiful hierarchical pattern, just like a family tree. It is a family tree. How would you explain that? And where is the evidence? Well, the evidence is in no, the DNA. Excuse me. Where is the evidence? Number nine, evolution depends on mutations and mutations are always harmful. To clarify, evolution doesn't rely on mutations to randomly create an eye or an organ. A mutation is usually just one single point error in the copying of DNA, like a T changing to a G or a C changing to an A. Most mutations are neutral. Whether a mutation is helpful or not entirely depends on the environment the organism is living in or its descendants are living in. If a mutation is harmful, then the carrier of that gene doesn't live long enough to survive and reproduce to pass it on. So I'm quoting from Talk Origins, which is linked in the show notes, quote, A strand of ATAGC may change to ATATC. This can have three major effects, a deleterious effect, a positive effect, or no effect at all. Deleterious effects, those which threaten the survival of the organism, will not accumulate because they will kill the organism before it has a chance to reproduce. Conversely, mutations which cause no effect or have a positive effect will accumulate in a population's genome. This is how natural selection works. It selects for positive changes in the genome because only the positive changes will accumulate. Additionally, certain mutations can add new, large pieces of DNA at a time. End quote. Number 10. Random chance could never create something as complex as an organism. So, natural selection is not a random process. It is the opposite of random. And everyone agrees that selection can change organisms since everyone recognizes various examples of artificial selection or selective breeding. Natural selection is just when the environment is applying the selection pressure rather than an agent. Chance does play a part in evolution. Random mutations give rise to new traits and natural selection acts upon those genes, but evolution does not depend on chance to create organisms. Adaptive features are selected for by the environment, adaptive meaning a trait that aids survival and reproduction, Random chance does not shape organisms. While biologists think that organisms adapt to their environment, creationists think that the entire environment was adapted to the organism. Number 11. Evolution violates the second law of thermodynamics. So the second law states that the net entropy always rises in an isolated system. The Earth is not an isolated system. There is a giant ball of energy in the sky constantly adding new energy into the system. Typically, creationists try to say that while the Earth may not be an isolated system, the universe is an isolated system. 
The universe may or may not be an isolated system. We don't know. If it's not, we don't really have a problem. But let's say that the universe is an isolated system, which is the best case scenario for the Christian apologist. The second law states that the net entropy must always increase or stay the same. That means that isolated pockets of the universe may have decreasing entropy, while the entropy of the universe as a whole is rising. Local areas may witness decreases in entropy, while the net entropy of the universe as a whole is still rising so the second law isn't violated. Number 12. Evolution is incompatible with the Cambrian explosion. Many conditions have to be met for fossils to form at all, and it's lucky that we have any. It's particularly difficult for animals without hard skeletons to be fossilized. So we'd expect fossils to appear suddenly, since skeletons hard enough to fossilize appeared relatively suddenly in evolutionary history. And that relatively is important. The duration of the Cambrian explosion was 25 million years, and it's still not what was predicted by creationists. I don't know why they even bring this up. It's not like we saw giraffes and humans and dogs in the Cambrian explosion. They still don't come until much, much later, which doesn't match up with the Christian creation myth. Number 13, missing links. If you're bringing up missing links and you have internet access, you are bordering on willful ignorance. Just about every fossil found is potentially an intermediate between something and something else. Transitional fossils for numerous species can be found with a casual Google. There are a few gaps, but historically, far more have been filled than have been left empty. The genetic evidence and the fossil record both show a hierarchical branching of life that would be predicted if life evolved from common ancestry. Number 14, carbon dating. So, the limits of carbon dating are well known, and these limitations, by the way, were discovered by scientists, not by creationists. We also don't just use carbon dating to get the ages of things. There are several radiometric and non-radiometric methods for dating various types of material. We can use potassium-argon dating, rubidium-strontium dating, luminescence dating, or a host of other options that can reliably date material from tens of thousands of years ago to billions of years ago, depending on the specific method. These are all essentially independent ways to measure the ages of objects, and they get the same answer. Number 15, irreducible complexity. So this is the idea that there are things in nature that are too complex to have evolved by chance. The system they're pointing to is composed of many interacting parts and would be useless if any one of its constituent parts were removed. The components couldn't have all appeared at the same time, and yet the system wouldn't work unless they were all there. What good is half an eye, etc.? So natural selection is not a chance process. Things come about by gradual degrees in evolution, not by chance. There has never been an example of something in nature that couldn't have come about by natural selection. And evolution is a cumulative process. Things that were once used for one purpose are repurposed for other uses. Even if you explain the evolution of the eye or bacterial flagellum, creationists still may not accept it. And at this point, they're just invoking an argument from personal incredulity. Creationists also ask how something so apparently perfect as the eye just sprang into existence. Well, it didn't. The basic chemistry that makes up a light-sensitive cell is shared right across the animal kingdom, and natural selection has seized on this time and time again. Science has uncovered species at every stage in the evolution of the eye. It is a cumulative process, and each step of the way is more useful than the one before. Number 16, bacterial flagellum. Biochemical and cellular irreducible complexity is more favorable to creationists of late than organs like the eye. The bacterial flagellum is probably the most famous example of alleged biochemical irreducible complexity. The bacterial flagellum is a whip-like motor with amazing molecular engineering. Kenneth Miller, a devout Christian, wrote the best refutation of the irreducible complexity of the bacterial flagellum in his book Finding Darwin's God. He lays out the evolutionary history of the bacterial flagellum, stating that these molecular mechanisms started off as one thing, served its function perfectly well, and served various different purposes all along the way to its eventual role that it fills today. This is actually not a new argument, it's the same one that defeated other older examples of irreducible complexity. Half of any organ isn't good at its current function, but it serves a different function perfectly. Like I said, evolution is a cumulative process, and things that were once used for one purpose are repurposed in new environments with new pressures. And evolution is not goal-oriented. We're not evolving towards any end point. 
So it doesn't even make sense to speak of half an eye or half of anything, really. Number 17, abiogenesis. How did life begin? The truth is that nobody knows for sure, but this has absolutely no bearing on whether evolution by natural selection is how that life developed and changed after it appeared, whatever that process was. It's a separate discussion entirely. Evolution is the change in populations over generations. Abiogenesis is the process by which replicating, metabolizing matter emerged from non-living matter. Scientists have plenty of ideas about how this could have happened, but unlike religious people, scientists aren't willing to come out and say they know something they don't actually know. The creationist argument boils down to nothing but a god of the gaps. Here's something we don't have a definitive answer for, therefore God. It wasn't too long ago you could have made the same argument with volcanoes and earthquakes and miscarriage and sickness. And no, I don't have faith that the gap will be filled. I'm just observing a historical pattern that you would have to be intentionally obtuse to miss. We don't understand something, we attribute it to the supernatural, our knowledge grows and we get a naturalistic explanation. Why would this pattern stop right here? Number 18. DNA is a language, and languages only come from minds. So creationists are equivocating on the word language when they say this. A language does only come from a mind. It's a way for two minds to communicate things. But DNA is not a language in that sense. It doesn't contain a message. It contains instructions for chemicals. If you insist on calling it a language, then it would be more accurate to call it a programming language, which is a set of rules that instruct elements on how to function and behave. Creationists switch between these two meanings of language to try to make the argument that a mind must have created DNA, just like it requires a mind to create language in the first sense. Creationists might try to dodge this by saying that programming language, like computer programming language, is created by a mind, so their argument still stands. But natural selection is more than enough to decide which genes remain in the gene pool. Selection pressure from the environment is what programs organisms, not a mind. And if they reject the second definition of language, the programming language, then DNA is not a language in any sense. Number 19. Teach the controversy. So, there is no controversy among scientists and experts. The only controversy is among religious fundamentalists who think their holy book is literally true. We are as sure that creationism is vacuous as we are that astrology is vacuous, and we're not going to teach the controversy between astronomy and astrology, or chemistry and alchemy, either. And number 20, evolution equals immorality. It sounds to me as though you've got a, some kind of another agenda. Is it perhaps that your hostility to evolution, which by the way is not shared by bishops and archbishops and people like that, your hostility to evolution perhaps stems from something emotional. Like, I mean, <laughs> is, it, is it that you feel that, that evolution... I mean, I've heard people say, for example, uh, you know, I'm not related to a monkey. Tell people they're related to monkeys and they'll behave like monkeys. You if have, you're because, looking... You're looking for a so-called agenda, I'll tell you what it is. We believe that human beings should be treated with respect and dignity. Yes. And the reason we well, believe so that, I, the reason we believe that is because um, we can see that God created each one of us. And what we find is that philosophies that are built on evolution oftentimes lead to horrendic, horrific abuses against human beings. And you can see why, because it's drawn on a foundation that says human beings are just material. Of course, you can still respect human beings and recognize that they are only made of atoms, and it doesn't follow that if humans aren't made of only material, then we ought to respect them. How does that follow? Human beings have an immaterial soul, therefore we should respect them? Besides, the question of evolution and morality doesn't bear on whether or not evolution is true. The consequences of beliefs don't affect the truth or falsity of those beliefs. Facts don't care about your feelings. Even if belief in evolution caused everyone to be a murderer, that still wouldn't mean evolution was or wasn't true. It's just irrelevant. For more on the evolution and morality discussion, you can listen to episodes 8 and 9 where we talk about it more extensively. Scientists line up overwhelmingly on one side of this issue. It would have to be an enormous conspiracy going on between scientists of all different disciplines in all different countries to have such a consensus. Does that doesn't move you? No, not at all, because from a biblical perspective, I understand why the majority would not agree with the truth. Man is a sinner. Man is in rebellion against his creator. All these scientists are sinners? Well, young earth creationists believe that the biblical account of history in Genesis is literally true. 
According to creationists, every species was created basically in its current form, along with the entire universe less than 10,000 years ago. Not just Homo sapiens, or life on Earth, or the Earth itself, but the entire universe less than 10,000 years ago. And while this is incompatible with several separate fields, astronomy, biology, paleontology, archaeology, and chemistry, to name a few, their starting point is the Bible. They string together the genealogies from Adam to Jesus, arrive at their age of the universe, and deny any evidence that contradicts their sacred belief. To believe that the world is less than 10,000 years old, given that we know the world is actually 4.6 billion years old, it's equivalent to believing that the width of North America, right across from New York to San Francisco, is less than 10 yards. I mean, that's the scale of the error we're talking about. Obtaining truth isn't easy, and if you're listening to this podcast, your answer likely doesn't include magic, like theirs does. There's no reason to expect the real answer about anything to be easy and obvious. So when a family member demands that you explain 4 billion years of evolutionary history in 10 seconds or they won't believe it, I would remind them that the truth of evolution is not contingent on your ability to do that, real answers are hard, the universe doesn't owe it to you to be simple, and evolution is true whether you accept it or not. Those are all the counter-apologetics I have for you today. I have a new patron to thank, Rewi Arts. Thank you so much for your support. It does not go unnoticed, and thanks to all my patrons for making the show happen. You can support this show on a per-episode basis at patreon.com counter, where you can earn early access to every episode and access to bonus episodes. If you don't have the money to support on Patreon, but you still want to join the Religion of Evolution, you can like us on our social media or leave a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you can. The resources used for this episode can be found in the show notes. Thank you for joining me today. I've been Emerson Green, and I'll see you next time we meet to Counter Apologetics. Counter Apologetics.